If you only had an hour a day to work, what would you have to do in order to make that a reality, in order to make that happen? That's the question that Ari Mizell had to ask himself when he found himself inside of the hospital bed for not the first or the second, but the third time, absolutely crippled by Crohn's disease, which was brought on in his early 20s by being overwhelmed with stress. This forced him to rethink everything and change the way that he did business and he did life. And through the process of methodically systematizing and outsourcing almost every single area of his life, he was able to slowly start to reduce his stress and change his lifestyle so that he could reverse his Crohn's and put it into full remission. Since then, Ari has helped some of the world's biggest leaders transform their business through systematizing and outsourcing and delegating and also getting rid of the stuff that's unnecessary. And now he coaches clients all around the world and he only works 20 minutes a day and yes, that's a real thing and you're gonna find out exactly how he does it in this video. Ari's been a huge inspiration for me and through his frameworks and his ways of thinking and his content, I've been able to systematically start to remove myself from my own business so that I can start building a much healthier lifestyle, a much healthier way of being. And that is what I want for you. And if you haven't seen the other video that I created called Why I'm Optimizing for Time Wealth, and I'll put it up here for you to go watch after so you can get an idea of why this is so important and why you might wanna start thinking about about these things for yourself and your business. In this video, you're gonna learn how you can start optimizing your life and business and start removing yourself and getting rid of the things that don't actually matter and aren't moving the needle for the things that are important to you. Therefore, you can start freeing up your time and then we're gonna go into what do you actually do once you free up that time, once you've created that space in your life. You're gonna figure out how Ari has managed to create a business that works around him. You're also gonna learn how Ari manages to stay healthy now that he's put his Crohn's into remission and what his lifestyle actually looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. You're also gonna find out about the secret ninja place to find rockstar team members that are gonna be the best people to stay within your organization long-term. The little known ways that Ari has discovered to make sure that you're living a fulfilled life once you start to free up some of your time. And finally, what's really important when we really boil down to it, what's going to actually matter at the end of your life? We got a lot of value packed into this one, so really excited to get this to you because it's, it's something that's near and dear to my heart, and I wanna share these ideas that are gonna revolutionize the way that you think about time, your life, and your business. What does your typical day look like? Ciao. Um I always find that to be an amusing question. Pretty much, I start my day around 5.30 or 6. I get up and I'm making breakfast, lunch, stuff for the kids, getting them up at some point ready, get my wife fed as well, and then get the kids off to school. And then uh, it's sort of variable. So a lot of my actual like minutes and hours of the day, that time is really focused on stuff in the house. Contrary to what a lot of people might think about you know this outsourcing guru and whatnot, I do most, almost all of it myself. Interspersed throughout the morning and the day, I am speaking to coaching clients, which is done over Voxer. So it's all done asynchronously. I don't have any live calls. In a given day, I'll probably spend 20 minutes or so uh, doing that work, but it's you know interspersed in various parts of the day. Then I pick up the kids around, uh, well, one gets picked up at two, the others get picked up at three. And then depending on the day, we have some combination of Taekwondo and soccer uh, afterwards. <laughs> Then we all have dinner together. And tonight, uh, which I do two or three times a week, I will be working an overnight shift as a volunteer EMT with our local ambulance company. So that's a 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. And so that, that's, that's pretty much what a typical day looks like. How did you know stress was at the root of everything and that you needed to start building systems and outsourcing things? With my specific journey with Crohn's disease, I had a really clear sort of corollary to stress that was able, that once I was able to kind of clear my head a little bit and see it, it became very obvious. And everybody knows that sort of feeling of getting like butterflies in your stomach, you know, when you're like nervous about going on stage or something like that, that's totally normal. But with me, I would, anytime I would get stressed or angry or bothered or whatever, I would always feel it in my stomach. Like, but it wasn't like cramps. It wasn't like pain. It was always that sort of butterflies feeling. It was all the time though. It was like a constant thing. And what it turned out basically was that just was building and building inflammation uh, in my body and eventually Crohn's disease. Along the way, and I'm not sure exactly where this came about for me, but I, I've kind of recognized that control, in my mind, control is the antidote to stress. There are so many little things in our life that we can start to take control of, like our time. That's not a little one, but like our time, like our inbox, you know, like the, uh, some of the decisions that we make with, our, with how we spend our resources and money, energy, all these kinds of things. 
We also know from a lot of just tons and tons and tons of data and research that stress is an inflammatory agent. There's just that it is. Starting to take control of my diet and my data, my biohacking data was really huge for me to start to recognize that I could make a difference in what I was feeling because when you're in a battle with your own body, it's a very hard place to be if you feel like your body is basically your enemy. What are the beliefs around time and outsourcing that allows you to create what you create? Because I know that in the beginning, when you're letting go of these things and you're changing the way that you do things, you're letting go of a part of your identity as well. That's a big problem for a lot of people. And that's why my last, well, uh, second to last book was called The Replaceable Founder. It's all about becoming more and more replaceable, not replacing yourself necessarily, but replaceable. And ego is such a problem in all this stuff because there's so many things that we do that anybody does that they feel like is so unique to them and the value that they bring to the world when it's usually something entirely different that serves as that actual value that in many ways the other stuff is getting in the way of it. For me, the extreme restriction on my time that I inevitably faced because of my illness was really the biggest factor in this because essentially I went from working like these 18 hour days to working an hour a day if I was lucky. And you take that question, which is what would you do if you could only work an hour a day, which is something I ask myself daily and something that I bring up with my clients all the time. Those limits are your best friend. In my mind, one of the definitions of mastery, right? If you have mastery over a subject, then you should be able to teach it to somebody who is less skilled and maybe less intelligent than you. So it's, it's total BS when somebody says like, oh, they can't do it. It just means that they don't want to teach it. They don't know how to teach it, but they really don't know it as well as they think. I mean, it is a thought experiment, but let's, this isn't hyperbole, right? It's like, what if you literally only had an hour a day that you could work or do anything related to work? What would you do? Because at that point, there's obviously going to be a lot of things that you just can't do in an hour. One of two things, either of those things you've realized just don't actually have to get done at all, which certainly happens. Or you're like, well, it still has to get done, but it's just not possible to get done in an hour. Well, then who or what is going to do it for you? But you figured out that there is this thing that only you can do. And, and even uh, that's, uh, that's the wrong vernacular, actually. It's not even that you only can do it. It's really the, the thing that you should be focusing on. Let's put it that way. And then everything else can actually get done by something else, like an automation or someone else. Uh, you just have to try to figure it out. So this is something that I've been grappling with recently because I, I've, I've continued to free up more and more time um, very, very recently. And I sometimes I feel this like guilt. I don't know how to explain it, but maybe you'd know what I'm already speaking into. So there's a, a few issues that come up with that. Um, the, the first one, we have this culture where we're trying to be more productive rather than more effective. And it's a really, really important distinction, right? So productivity is producing more, right? Efficiency is producing more with less, cool. Effectiveness is producing the right things, right? And so when you have cultures, whether it's a company culture, a larger sort of ethnographic culture that wants people to just do more stuff. Ultimately, we create burnout. It's not sustainable. Uh, and we don't actually get the best thing possible. I never want to incentivize productivity, which sounds crazy, right? Because I'm a productivity expert, but that's not what we're looking for. We're not looking for people who can work harder. That's not interesting, that's not innovative, and it's not sustainable. We want people who can be effective. So you have people who, because of the pandemic and because of working from home now, are working two and sometimes three full-time jobs from home with three different companies in a 40-hour work week and making five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars a year. We know from years and years of data that in the average 40-hour week, the typical worker does about eight to 10 hours of actual work, right? And because most of that other time is spent with commuting, lunch breaks, talking to coworkers, surfing the web, going on Facebook, all these things, meetings that have no purpose, they're actually doing eight to 10 hours of real work every week. So why not? I think that there's a lot of companies who would flip out and immediately fire people. They found out they were working two and three full-time jobs with other companies. To me, those are the people that should be running everything. Where, where do you see the biggest opportunities for big chunks of time for people to get back? What I would say is start to look at communications in general, right? Because it's something that we all spend a lot of time on. So communication in terms of your email inbox, um, meetings that you're having, sales calls, whatever, whatever it might be. Look at the way that you're spending time communicating 
first of all, as far as like your inbox, inbox zero to me is a very, very important thing uh, because the email problem for most people is not an email problem, it's a decision-making problem. And if we can get more effective at making decisions, which the inbox just happens to be a really good model for, we get better at making decisions in general. And decisiveness is a big time saver and helps us be more effective. So I wanna shift gears a bit and move more into like health stuff. You know, how can people apply these principles uh, to improve their, their health, their quality of life, their energy, all the things, like reduce their stress, all these things? Yeah, so I mean, not to sound like a broken record, but asynchronous communication to me has been the, the biggest sort of stress reducer ever, uh, first of all. So that's, that's really key to me. But as far as how that sort of fits in with health, so one thing is, so I have not, I haven't worked out in maybe three years. And, you know, part of that is that I, like last Thursday, I dug up 14 trees and moved them to another part of our property by myself, right? Um, so I'm extremely active. It's actually interesting. My I just had my blood tested. My inflammatory markers are very similar to what they were when I was training for Ironman. And I'm in incredible shape as far as I believe. Blood markers were all really good. I'm the same weight that I used to box at. I do intermittent fasting, which to me is, I wish I had known about intermittent fasting when I was dealing with my Crohn's stuff, I would, and I didn't. That was something I learned about much later. I think that would have been a silver bullet, honestly, if I had known about it at the time, giving my body that sort of break. So I pretty much, I eat between noon and 7 p.m., um, which actually works out really great for me. And then there's just sort of a baseline of supplements that I like to take each day. but that's kind of it. You know, it just, it fits into my lifestyle. There's no sort of extra work involved in making all those things happen. I make sure that I track this stuff just to know that what I'm feeling is real. Yeah. Yeah. I heard on another podcast that your favorite person, your favorite type of person to hire is women that have military experience. Um, how do you find these people? Uh, and how can I go about, <laughs> how can someone go about locating them and recruiting them and bringing them on into the organization as part of the team? Yeah, I always feel like I'm going to piss off somebody when I say that, but it's just, it's the truth. Like I've, I've hired, I have personally hired over 400 people in the last you know decade, basically. And there's just something very, very consistent about women with military experience. Um, I have had several men with military experience work for me as well and just have not seen the same level of consistency. I, I'm, I'm of the belief that like, it's not that the military necessarily did that. It's the kind of person that would go on that track in their life is probably going to be like the right candidate for that kind of thing. But there is a, there's a Yiddish word, which is a macher right? Which is like the, it's basically a doer. It's like a person who will get things done. Something it's generally like in cinema, something sort of nefarious, but that's how I kind of see these people a lot of times. So uh, in terms of finding those people, the army does a, or the, the military in general does a really, really horrible job of transitioning their soldiers into the real world. A lot of the, uh, the military colleges have recruitment offices, which are really great and very happy to help with this kind of stuff. But the Army and the Navy also uh, haven't worked with the Marine Division, but they also have, I forget what they call it now. It's like transition something, but they have offices that, as well. And so uh, you can get lists and lists and lists of candidates who are looking for jobs at that point. But also any of the regular places you would hire, like Indeed, Simply Hired, all those things, I would say that like military experience is a plus. Like I would put that in the, the descriptions. How do you teach others to fill the void once they've freed up their time and not squander that time? It's a really good question because it's a hard one for a lot of people. What I find with a lot of these entrepreneurs, with a lot of my clients too, is that they have a lot of trouble being alone with themselves. And that sounds like kind of woo-woo-ish, but it, it, it's, uh, it's one of the reasons what they'll keep themselves busy. And if they don't have something to work on, they'll start like sabotaging things without even realizing it. They need things to fill that space in an effective way. And we don't want to fill it just to fill it. But there's sort of two categories that I would look at. Um, and I have both of those in, in kind of what I do. So they're, they're good examples. So one is, and it sounds cliche, but like we, you need a hobby of some sort, but it has to be a hobby where there's a couple things to it. One is that there's an opportunity for mentorship. Okay. So that's like a really good one. So like with the you word working from someone else or you teach from someone else for you to be a, a mentee basically. Okay. Uh, and then eventually maybe a mentor as well. So one is that there really should be some opportunity for a sort of mentor and menteeship. The other one is that it should be something that like you really have an opportunity to not only get better at, but be bad at, 
Mm-hmm. Right. So that's uh, like that's why also like stamp collecting was not necessarily a good one. There's all sorts of hobbies out there, right? Um, I think it is important to be able to do something with your hands, but that could be that could be creating music, right? That could be a hobby, and that's that's totally fine. The other one is something that is in some way in service to others. Uh, which I think is really important. So for me, that's, that's the EMS stuff. Uh, and the EMS stuff for me is amazing because not only am I doing that, but uh, it's a constant learning experience. Everything is always different. It's very exciting. It's kind of like checks all the different boxes for me. What are people not asking you about that you wish they would? And what do you want to share with, uh, share with the, you know, the audience right now about uh, maybe something that is there and is important to you, but is not being spoken into? So I'm working on a side project right now which is, uh, it's gonna be a podcast series on a selection of the world's oldest companies. So one of the things that has been sort of blaringly obvious in examining these companies, and part of it is just it, the business aspect is interesting. I always love history, but there's just so many cool lessons from these companies. They're not about scaling. They're not about taking investor money and growing as fast as possible and growing a user base. Like these are companies that have existed for, in some cases, dozens of generations. And the legacy is so important. But what you see with these companies is that being a, the companies basically are considered a member of their larger community right? More than almost anything else. Like that is extremely important. And when you are part of that company, you are part of that community. I've, I've had some very, very well-known clients that uh, have had legacies that they've created. All these, I, I've seen life cycles. People will rarely, if ever, be remembered for the things they did as much as the way they made people feel. And so that's something that very few people actually think about in their daily lives. How are you making the people around you feel? The team, your clients, your family. Where, uh, where can people find you? What's the best place to get in touch with you? Where, uh, where can they learn more about what you're up to? Everything's on the website, lessdoing.com. Uh, but they can also go to voxwithari.com and get in touch with me directly. And it's my voice, so it's, it's not going to be an assistant. It's not an automation. It will actually be me. And I do really welcome that. So voxwithari.com and lessdoing.com. Cool, man. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you, Ari. And uh, yeah, I hope... You, the audience member, you found this valuable and uh, we'll see you in the next one. The biggest things I took away from this conversation was really challenging the beliefs of what's possible. When you hear someone like Ari only working 20 minutes a day and he's a father of four and he's doing woodworking and he is trying to be the best husband that he can and he does EMT, I'm like, this man is living a fulfilling life and a lot of this life is coming outside of work. And so it really starts to beg the question, you know, what is available to you outside of work? And are, have we been fed a narrative that just isn't true around what it means to be fulfilled, what it means to be productive, what it means to be successful? And I wanted to start making this type of content to start nudging you in the direction of thinking about these things because my challenge was that I was always trying to succeed, I was always trying to achieve, I was always trying to do more, right? But what if you didn't have to work? Because the biggest excuse that I have made for myself and that I hear from others around getting healthier or adopting healthier habits or living a healthier lifestyle always comes down to time. And so when we can start to free up time, we can start really doing those things and giving ourselves that space to actually take care of ourselves. That's what I want for you. The biggest lessons that I learned from Ari was number one, asynchronous communication. That's using Voxer and getting everyone to communicate on Voxer. And therefore you can drop a message in on your own schedule and they can drop a message in on your own schedule. And it just kind of goes back and forth like that. Number two is as you start to free up some of this time, you wanna find an activity, a hobby that you can start putting your energy into that has a mentorship component. And this is the big distinction is I I always thought, okay, let me find a hobby that I can do or something I can spend my time on that's outside of work and, and that's great. But the mentorship component is is the real distinction there because then you have this ability to uh, learn from someone. There's that, that dynamic that you have between the person who's teaching and the person who's learning. The next thing that I took away from my discussion with Ari was finding something that you can do to be of service to others, right? So you fill up your cup, you're taking care of your health, your finances are good, your relationships are good. Now it's like, how can we put this energy that's overflowing onto others? How can we help others? How can we help alleviate the suffering of someone else or maybe just support someone in a way that is close to us? And finally, if you're a business owner and entrepreneur and you have your own business, start thinking about not how can I just 
grow this company? How can I make more money? But also, how can I be more involved in my community? How can I build relationships into my business? How can I invest into my people and, and really become something that's integral in people's lives around me? And how can I enhance the quality of other people's lives and how they feel, right? Because at the end of the day, they don't remember what you said or what you did, but how you made them feel. With that being said, I have another video coming out soon talking about how to use systems thinking to free up all of your time. And I'll put that up here when it goes live and down in the description as well. If you wanna start applying some of these principles immediately, I just launched my blog. And if you opt into my email list, I will send you my playbook on how to free up 10 to 15 hours per week like that. So go join the squad and I'll see you in that next video. Take care, be well.